Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good evening, depending on uh, where you are watching us from. My name is Renata Avila, and um, I am thrilled to be part of the AI Festival when machines dream the future. And today, we in this session, we are going to talk something very, very important. AI by whom and for whom? AI ethics, power, and the problem of representation. And the speakers that we have today, there are three remarkable individuals. One is Cynthia Bennett, disability researcher from Carnegie Mellon University. Then Tiara Roxanne, researcher and artist uh, from Berlin. And Ishan Shah, cultural and media scientist at the Artes University uh, of the Arts. Uh, so AI by whom and for whom? We know that the parting point is one of the most problematic ones and the, the parting point for AI is data. And data uh, is uh, power in this era. And the data that we have today that we are building the AI with today is expert in excluding the many. It is expert in reproducing uh, prejudices. It is uh, data that doesn't count those who are not visible for society or that miscounts and misrepresents entire populations. We also know that uh, uh, the other element that uh, feeds AI is instructions perpetuating, perpetuating and continue, continuing prejudices. It is deployed in systems of surveillance and control that of course target the many, target the, on the most oppressed populations everywhere. Also, it also targets those who raise up their voices and it is rapidly spreading in borders, in checkpoints, in plazas, everywhere we go. And when uh, we look at the systems and we looked at the, the either like, you know, include to repress or exclude uh, the, the, those who need the, the most uh, support in our society, we discovered that there's nobody to hold accountable because who, by whom, who is doing this, these, uh, these technologies? And it's basically very few companies interested in profit instead of serving people. So um, what we are going to discuss today is uh, precisely how this dynamic is unfolding. And we are going to start uh, on how this AI ecosystem today is dreams of the very few that are trying to create these very sophisticated systems and nightmares of the many, the many who are discriminated by algorithms, the many who are oppressed uh, by these sophisticated technologies, the many who have not a chance to create. We are going to start now uh, with uh, Dr. Cynthia Bennett, and uh, we will start uh, this conversation discussing the real problems that uh, this exclusion uh, is making in the process of making, deploying, and testing AI. Uh, please, Cynthia, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Renata, and thank you for um, inviting me. And I'm really excited to have this conversation with the other panelists. So as Renata mentioned, I am a researcher of disability and accessibility at Carnegie Mellon University. And I study the impact of technology on people with disabilities. Um, both in the ways that technology might be a tool for access, um, but also for the ways that technology might do harm. And in one of my recent focuses, I've been looking at the ways that data and automation impact people with disabilities. And so to Renata's point, um, right now, um, AI and machine learning tend to replicate our societal biases. And so a couple of recent examples that really affect people with disabilities are when um, algorithms and automation make decisions that impact people's lives. And we all know that during the COVID-19 pandemic, healthcare has been a big topic. And um, actually a lot of healthcare industries use automation to make decisions that are faster than humans making those decisions. And so unfortunately, uh, often people with disabilities are not included in data or in those pipelines. And also, um, ableist and discriminatory views of people with disabilities become embedded in these pipelines to, for example, triage care, um, so that someone who appears to be the most healthy deserves better care. And so right now, as machine learning kind of represents the dreams of the few people, we see that it's kind of replicating societal um, bias 
and not representing um, people with disabilities who, you know, in certain cases, automation could actually be quite helpful. Um, so that's just a brief example of some of uh, very disability specific impact, um, potentially harmful impact of, of AI and machine learning. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Cynthia. We will now discuss the, this point with Nishan. Nishan, how, which nightmares are you seeing in the space? Could you tell us? Uh, I mean, it's a very, very, it's a horror story unfolding. So I would love to hear your point about this. Um, sure, thanks, Renata, and thanks everyone for making it here. I'm also very excited to have this conversation with my fellow panelists. Uh, you know what, Renata, one of the things I was thinking about is that Perhaps in order to quest, uh, answer the question of the dreams and nightmares of AI, we might have to go via the route of philosophy of immortality. Uh, and I'm, I'm particularly choosing to do that because I think I want to stay away from talking about AI applications and AI computation and really start looking at AI aspirations. Because I mean, we have to admit, right, throughout history, um, one of the most pronounced axes of privilege has been time the capacity to master it, to own it, and to live beyond our own biological capacities. Um, the idea of eternal youth, or at least eternal life, has in fact been at the heart of almost all technological advancements. And perhaps it's good to ask the question of where AI is taking us in this quest of creating dreams that only a few can actually have. And there are two AI deployments that immediately come to mind. One is what I am facetiously calling the Elon Muskization of the world, right? This new machismo fuel space race with dreams of inhabiting future planets and escape the almost inevitable crisis of a climate collapse on Earth is something that we perhaps need to pay attention to. Because space race often brings up the images of mechanical engineering, right? Big rockets and satellites and farming and so on. But um, the fuel of the space race and the possibilities of colonizing new planets is supercomputing and artificial intelligence. It's good to understand that the deployment of current AI applications should not be confused with the ambitions of AI applications, which is the creating of what you know Duncan Watts had once called a small world, where time and space can be governed to create small worlds that few can afford to occupy. And the second one is in the field of biotechnology. You know, I mean, we've all been taken aback at how Facebook changed its name to Meta, but a few years ago, Google changed its name to Alphabet. And it's important to remember that when it did that, it was signaling Google's own ambitions, having grown larger than its search flagship. Uh, Alphabet has since then, very secretly, very quietly, invested heavily in biotechnology, genetic engineering, and robotics and bioweaponry. They had once in a press conference very grandly, grandly announced that they are planning to cure death. And the way of doing that would be both at the level of technological singularity, where the human gets transferred to code, but also at the level of biopenetration, where the human gets edited as if it is made out of code in order for us to live longer. So right, both of these conditions of going larger than the human, so achieving planetary scales, and going smaller than the human, so turning us into data sets, are for me the dreams of the few and the nightmares of the many that perhaps I'd like to explain more later on. Thank you, Nish. And then, Diara, now uh, from your perspective of artist, and I mean, and living in Berlin at the epicenter of many of the, one of the countries like leading the technologies, what's your view, what, what's the nightmare that makes you more scared? What was your vision on, on uh, uh, on the darkest aspects of, of, of the situation of the AI made by the few and uh, not necessarily to help the many. Yeah, um, thanks Renata for the question and thank you Cynthia for your <clears throat> wonderful and very important input and Nishant um, for also including the importance of philosophy when it comes to investigating and exploring aspects of artificial intelligence when it comes to when I when I hear of the few or a few I'm thinking about marginalized voices and the people who are pushed to the margins the individuals who remain unseen and unheard um, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence creation, modeling, platforms, um, data mining extraction, surveillance, it's extremely crucial to think about um, who is creating it, why it's being created and for whom, 
Um, something that is really important for me, you know, is as an indigenous mestiza uh, woman living in Berlin, who is also an artificial intelligence researcher and um, creates data visualization projects um, and explores data colonialism and the terror of data colonialism um, against indigenous peoples through performance art um, in order to um, have different modes of accessibility, uh, meaning that, you know, I, I think that this, this question you're asking regarding nightmares and, and terror of um, artificial intelligence uh, toward marginalized people is, is not enough. Um, meaning that data colonialism, where an uh, indigenous tribe or an indigenous person is not identified in a data set, it becomes more than horror because that um, more than a nightmare. Uh, meaning that when you, as an indigenous person, are not um, identified within a data set and are unseen and do not have a voice. Therefore, you will not have access to resources. A prime example of that is the Navajo Nation in the United States. When their tribe is placed as other in a data set, they will not have access to resources. And during the height of the pandemic um, last year, the Navajo Nation didn't have access to running water to wash their hands because they were not put within a data set for resources. So when I think of nightmare, I think of this kind of consistent terror that happens, um, but more in terms of how maybe Nishant is speaking um, philosophically. I, I think it's really cool to talk about nightmares um, in relation to artificial intelligence because it provides us all, um, participants, panelists, um, artists, scholars, um, anyone to really speak and engage with artificial intelligence in abstract ways of thinking. So I really appreciate that, but, but for me, and I'll go into this more later, I have a little, um, something that I would like to read uh, more specifically about data colonialism because I find it so important. Um, I, I, I feel like the concept nightmares is just not enough. I feel like we have to go deeper um, and investigate it more um, because there is a, a, a devastation um, that marginalized peoples um, are experiencing when it comes to artificial intelligence more generally. Thank you, Tiara. And I, I wanted to go. I want to go back to Cynthia because uh, I re, uh, listening to all this very bad scenario that Tiara described, and listening to Nish and, and these you know big tech companies trying to play God and big ambitions. We will conquer a, a planet, or or maybe two. We will create and dominate absolutely nature, and they cannot even invest in proper testing to serve the people in this planet today. So uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, Cynthia, uh, I mean, your view on that, why we don't have like, you know, strong rules on the design of the tech of the future to do proper testing and serve everybody in society? Who do you think that should be like the, the how can we like activate uh, accountability at that, that level? So the product cannot be, and the, the system cannot be deployed if it's not, if it's not if tested as it should and serving everybody. Um. Yeah, this is Cynthia speaking. So I get this question a lot and I, there's obviously not an easy answer. And I don't think there will be until there's kind of a significant redistribution of power. I mean, and I love that term data colonialism, colonialism that Tiara was, was mentioning and thinking about who gets to own and who decides what's included. Um, I. Often when I when I talk to people, I do think about kind of justice movements and thinking about how we can make change at different levels. So there's, you know, a role for policy. There's a role for, you know, responsible, um, you know, for for companies 
making products, you know, often I feel like they are trying to evade policy rather than actually comply with policy. Um, so I, I kind of see this happening in different institutions and then also even at the individual level, kind of taking what accountability you can in your own workplace. But uh, just a second factor that I do want to bring up, it's something I'm noticing is um, our neglect to understand how systems connect, I think contributes to this problem. So even in cases where maybe there is accessibility testing or an AI solution is built for the purposes of increasing accessibility, often it's only thought of through that singular perspective. And we're not thinking about, oh, well, even if it has an accessibility benefit, um, what are the potential harms? Um, and so we see that often people living at intersections, um, you know, so maybe people who are gender minorities, you know, might be being misgendered by technologies that are providing information to um, blind people who can't see. Um, and so I think one of the other problems is, is not just having like, systems of accountability in place, but recognizing connections. And that's something that may have a potential benefit if understood through a singular lens, like providing access or information um, could still be doing harm um, to, to other people or even sometimes the same people. So. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Uh, I, I, don't, I want to go back to Tiara uh, on something very important to me. Like uh, one of the things, and that's why this festival is very valuable, is to make the topic accessible to people and, and, to, and to make people understand, even if we, I, nobody, like very few people can understand an algorithm when they, they see it, they understand the effects and, the, and how the sausages are made, really. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, like, uh, uh, how are you doing that with your art? If you can mention examples on and your research and your art, how can you make, how are you making sure that uh, we bridge that gap and we connect? How, how, how are you designing systems to connect with the topic, uh, connect uh, the many worlds of the, of the marginalized uh, that you work with, with the topic? Yeah, thanks so much, um, Renata, for the question. <clears throat> and uh, Cynthia, again, for the very important input. Um, I, yeah, I, you know, when I first started uh, doing, writing my dissertation <laughs> about data colonialism, I started writing so many uh, scholarly articles. And um, I'm thinking, okay, so I'm writing about indigenous data sovereignty and I'm writing about data harm um, toward indigenous peoples. And I start thinking, um, how are my people, how are these people, you know, going to access this and um, talk about data mining extraction when they don't even know it's happening and how it's happening and what is happening. So I started to do more performance art um, and data visualization projects, um, specifically one that is called They Are, We Are, I Am. And it was through Toronto uh, Trinity Square Video. I had a solo exhibition planned, um, for example, at, uh, in the height of COVID at the beginning of Corona, was uh, canceled and I had to switch the entire solo exhibition online within a week. Um, and uh, anyway, sorry, I just saw the, the chat. Um, they Are We Are I Am is about saying that indigenous peoples are still here. We are still practicing ceremony and tradition and we are still present um, as a response to being historicized. And an example of that is, is these kind of uh, temples of indigeneity placed within art museums and cultural institutions through an appropriative and, and settler colonial gaze. And in, a, in an order to respond to this, I created this data visualization project um, that was supposed to be site specific, and meaning that I would go to different tribal locations and look at data that is being collected on these tribes and kind of exploit that in a way that anyone can participate with that data. And in that way, I wanted people to be forced to acknowledge the harm of data, to see that they are seen 
and that the indigenous peoples aren't. And so uh, this um, kind of manifested in this online project and uh, allowed for anyone to experience that data collection process. Um, and that was just one example that my artistic process um, imagined or hoped to provide a different mode of accessibility. And that's something that I'm dedicated to moving forward. In my, in my experience working with uh, persons and indigenous people, I, there's also a lot to learn for the uh, data activism movement. Because uh, talking with uh, uh, persons from Brazil and indigenous in Guatemala fighting the big mining companies, I have found that, that uh, uh, they know how to deal with extractivism and they know about the mm -hmm. tactics of resistance. We will move now to the other, to the, the second part. And the second part is, uh, is something that uh, always makes me remember Chile and remember the, the cyber scene project where you know, a progressive government was trying to do, make wonderful things for people with the technology they had at the time. That was not as remotely as advanced as the technologies today. So we have today these rich people trying to, you know, trips to the space and creating a very sophisticated technologies just to serve the, the top of society. Okay, it looks like we've lost Renata's connection. Uh, and while she's coming back, she had actually sent me a prompt on chat to pick it up. So maybe I can continue the conversation there. Uh, and then hopefully she will jump in. Is that fine, Cynthia and Tiara? This is Cynthia, I think that's fine. Okay, yeah, all right. Totally. Good. So um, while Renata is kind of coming back, one of the things that she had asked me in the next set was to think about um, what, what happens when we dream about machines, right? What are the kinds of machines that we are dreaming of when we talk about artificial intelligence? Uh, and I also immediately wanted to connect it with uh, something that I'm learning as we speak, both from you, Cynthia, and from Tiara, about how it is not the appearance of AI, right? So when AI goes wrong and when we can detect it, that's not really the problem point. The problem point is when it becomes invisible in creating different kinds of decision-making structures. And we don't even know that things have gone wrong or certain kinds of exclusions have happened uh, and so on and so forth. So I wanted to build upon that a little bit and saying when we dream about, like, like you know, to go to Renata's question of what are the kinds of machines we dream about when we talk about AI, um, and I thought it would be useful perhaps to realize that the dream of computation has gone through many different um, modes of human computer engagement, right? Um, because uh, the earlier imagination in the history of human computer relationships was about the computer as a tool, like things that we do things with. Uh, and then we have long since transitioned to computers as companion tools. So things that we live with and do things together with. Uh, and the, I think the new dreams of computers that AI offers is one of computers as sacred tools. Um, the, the speed, the scale, and the acceleration of AI-driven models is so unfathomable and so impossible to grasp in human scales that we have no choice but to give ourselves to the dream of subjugating to artificial intelligence, right? To be ruled, governed, shaped, and if we end up in Mars, then being kept alive through these AI. So it's a paradigm for me that's perhaps being reinforced by two different principles. Um, I'm also kind of building on Donna Haraway, reminding us way back in the 1980s uh, that one day computation is going to build a matrix of domination 
uh, which we are not going to be able to get out of very quickly. Uh, and there are two principles I want to foreground in it. One is the principle of efficiency, right? And it's an old thought experiment that we've done in computer human interaction since a long time. Right now, if you imagine a person who is the closest to you and you, you are given an idea that they are, they are very, very sick and that a machine can keep them alive, and all that has to do is somebody has to punch a button once every 20 seconds. And as long as you keep on punching that button, the person will keep alive. And you know immediately that even though you are the closest to this person, you are not going to want to take the responsibility of keeping that person alive by punching that button every 20 seconds because you know that you are only human and you're going to falter. You, you will hold somebody's life in your hands. Whereas you would be very happy to give this responsibility to a machine because we inherently trust that machines don't fail, right? that machines perform these things better than human beings. So there is this naturalization of a principle of machines that keep us alive on the level of efficiency. And the second principle is that of verificatory robustness. Because let's face it, I mean, you and I, um, the humans are messy and we are fragile and fragmented and untruthful uh, because we recall and remember and forget and twist and manipulate and experience things differently at different times. Uh, but what we have here is a new dream about machines that keep us alive and they are shaping our futures. And most importantly, they keep on insisting that machines are clean technologies, which are going to clean up the mess of us dirty humans, right? What we are investing in the dreams of AI uh, we are going to resolve the messiness of the human by creating this new paradigm of subjugation, where we have to create, create AI, uh, AI almost as a divine intervention, right? So because in AI, we trust. And the trust is that it will keep us alive and protected from ourselves. And I think it's that paradox which needs to kind of be disentangled when we dream about the future of machines. Renata, sorry, I just picked up from the prompt you had given and continued on it, but come and please speak us over. Thank you so much, and thank you for saving me. It was good to have this backup plan. Um, uh, apologies, I was expelled from the system. I shouldn't uh, speak bad things about Mr. Musk, it seems. Uh, uh, I will go now back to Tiara. And if you, you could dream, you know, like the, what would be like the idea of your dreams? What would be like the technology or even the process to making that technology that, uh, that you will set up, Tiara? Like you, you have one wish today one dream today to oh, imagine and wow. wow really on the spot here um <laughs> i i think that gosh i don't mean to be such a pessimist but i'm not sure if that that's even possible um i think that dream would have to um yeah not so much be first of all techno solutionist um but if I have to create um, or imagine something in in that 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 frame of thought, it would be in the a, a non-colonial digital territory that exhibits trust and safety developed by indigenous tribes from around the world that holds the sacred knowledge and oration and stories with and for and by those indigenous communities without oppressing them. That sounds very dreamy and I'm almost even embarrassed to imagine that out loud, um, but I'm definitely dedicated to dreaming that every day. And that's precisely, I mean, I want to, you know, I want to cry and clap now because <laughs> That's what, you know, like uh, I, the nightmares that we are living shouldn't like uh, restrict our ability to dream. I think that that's something to remember here, that the nightmares and the imperfections and the oppression, if we, if we give up dreaming, then uh, it would be like a very, very, very hard to wake up every morning and face reality. I will go, go now with Cynthia and, and ask her, about this, uh, what would be like uh, the, the technology you want, the technology you dream? Oh my God, this is Cynthia. Thank you uh, so much, um, Nishan and Tiara, just for everything that you've said. So building on what Tiara was just saying, um, I, I think for any 
community, um, and particularly those which have been, you know, dispossessed and, and discriminated against, so Native people, Indigenous people, and people with disabilities, um, kind of thinking about how to, how automation or even just machine-assisted information um, archiving and transference can be rooted in local communities, but also for, for me as an accessibility researcher, I think about a, a lot about the access to information and how um, technology and automation can help translate information into different formats. And so I would extend kind of what Tiara was saying to also give um, local communities the, the ownership and power over how their information is distributed and translated. And so a very practical example that is happening now is um, I mentioned before, but didn't explain. Um, so a lot of you know, blind people can't see information and techniques of you know, computer vision and uh, object recognition and things like that could be used to provide access to information in someone's vicinity. Well, a lot of this automation is happening with the unchecked assumption that information is somehow neutral or unbiased, that there is a way to label a visual um, phenomenon in a textual format um, to translate that information to be non-visual. And that's just not true. And I brought up gender as an example of if, if you know, automation is using, um, you know, pixel analysis and pattern recognition and assigning labels to people um, that again is making an assumption first of all that anyone has the right to label anyone else in that way and then that's um, knowable just by analyzing a group of, of visual pixels so um, just to extend what Tiara is saying is I, I wish accessibility was um, obvious you know first of all a, a value that we all had and that second of all when we exercise that value that we could you know make the world accessible without harming other people um, and, and values in the process. And so by the dream um, that I think could help with that is that communities not only have you know, ownership of their own stories, but they have agency in how those stories circulate, how that information is interpreted and distributed. Thank you, Cynthia. And you mentioned a key, a key, a key word, and that word is community. Uh, because uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, to create the worlds and to create the systems that we want, we start to, to, to apply in these principles and living by those principles in our communities. And I, I, I was going back, you know, and thinking of my early education, kindergarten, when I was a little girl. It was always, you know, like uh, the average of be excellent or be faster, be like uh, be quicker of finishing the, the homework. And there's always this push, 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 push to to excel and it's very, very uh, little uh, attention in looking at who's around, in helping the others, in, in advancing as, as, as groups and as, collect, as collectives. And that's reflected in the technology indeed. But uh, following, um, we are moving quickly to our uh, last section because we want to, of course, uh, have time to share with the audience. And so we, we went from nightmares to dreams and now to the wake up call and the way that we are going to engage uh, with, uh, with the children of today, with the elderly of today, with uh, our world, our communities, our friends, our people right now. And uh, so starting with Tiara, we will discuss which will be the narratives and tactics uh, towards more what I call more AI power to the people. Uh, uh, what, what, what do you think yeah, that, that can be like a, a good narrative around it, a, a good tactic around it? What do you have in mind? What's coming <laughs> next? <laughs> yeah, um, thank you. And I think it really, it, it goes, it, that's a, a great um, transfer connection to what Cynthia is saying in terms of accessibility is um, community-centered research I think it's very important. Something that comes up for me when I'm thinking about a wake up call for indigenous peoples, um, for non-indigenous peoples, I would say, is to acknowledge uh, first and foremost um, that indigenous peoples are still here and that they are affected by artificial intelligence um, in very harmful ways and that there's an ongoing violence of that, which you know we, we highlighted in the nightmare section. I think that that's the first start of the wake up call is to acknowledge the, um, 
the violence of settler colonialism, which is embedded within artificial intelligence through surveillance, um, platform creation, and data mining extraction more specifically. Um, I think uh, moving toward what I mentioned on community-centered research um, goes, it draws from and is inspired by Eve Tuck. And Eve Tuck is an indigenous scholar from Canada. She is a goddess. If no one knows, uh, if you don't know about Eve Tuck, please read some of her work. She wrote a letter um, about damaged based research. And the letter is about how non-Indigenous peoples go in um, research, go into Indigenous communities, do research on them as damaged communities due to their oppressed experiences in the world and extract that data based on the oppression that they've experienced and take that data and leave the Indigenous community with more damage and more trauma. Um, so that was that's that's an example of active extraction, active data mining extraction on the ground, and this is something that is um, happening in the digital world all the time. And so I think moving from damage-based research, which Eve um, Tuck introduced me to, into more community-centered research, which draws from what Cynthia was just kind of talking about is um, working with the communities, creating um, resources, sharing resources, thinking about thinking together, having a shared dialogue together when it comes to the harm and possibilities of artificial intelligence and the effect on each of these communities as well. I I thank you so thank you so much for that uh, comprehensive uh, uh, answer and it let me it get I keep thinking how you know how colonial the methods to evaluate AI are and how uh, how uh, limited the methods to fix fix as uh, because it's just a claim AI. It looks like we lost Renata again. I think we should stop saying bad things about AI, like something bad is happening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, Cynthia, you were next on our Google sheet, like planning uh, to also talk about what is going to be the wake up call and what are the tactics and narratives that we need to put in. I think building upon what Tiara said, do you just want to continue with that? Yeah, this is Cynthia. Thanks Nishan for filling in. Um, so yeah, exactly. Again, everything that Tiara just mentioned and what I would add to that, um, and perhaps maybe this is uh, not a tactic, um, well, maybe it is, but I always tell people, you know, being willing to to say no. Um, and I think sometimes we, we want automation to be a universal solution. And Sometimes it's not the solution and sometimes there's a very specific use. Like we think we have tools for all types of things. We have different tools to help us with different tasks and there might be really great use um, for automation, but how do we then protect it and make clear what is the, the use that has been outlined by a community, by people who might be most impacted? Um, and then what are the limitations and what are the things that we don't use that tool for? Um, so I, I think some of the tactics are just being really clear and open to, um, you know, these tools, automation does not need to be universalizing. That's probably not realistic or healthy or, you know, ethical, um, but being really kind of community, not only developing the, the technology, but also kind of the standards of use around that. So thank you. Okay, thanks Cynthia, this is Nishan. So I will just then continue building on that. I mean. It, in some ways, it's always, always uncanny how community and care seem to be the default answers of dealing with the problems of AI. And as Renata was already mentioning, we seem to have very little capacity of figuring out how to build these communities of resistance, solidarity, and care. And I had an um, interesting answer to the question that Renata was posing, saying, what do we need to 
fixed AI, so to speak. And I'm going to be very outrageous and I'm going to suggest that what we need is poetry. Uh, I know oh, that I this sounds, that. yes, I know it sounds completely stupid, but let me <laughs> just expand upon it just a little bit in terms of why I think we need poetry precisely to build these communities of care uh, that we are talking about. I think the first thing that we need is ambiguity when dealing with AI. AI demands precision and boxing and cleanliness, but we are not clean people and we don't have to be that way. So in the recent book that I wrote with Alexandra Yuhas and Chanel Langlois, we actually make a plea about why in the, in, in the face of really fake news and fake information and AI driven um, verification systems, we need to make space for ambiguity um, because AI might force us to create definitions of what is AI, but in the process, we are actually trying to make definitions of what is human. And in defining one particular idea of what is human is where the roots of fascism lie. So I would say poetry and ambiguity. The second, I think we need metaphors. We need metaphors because we don't otherwise know how to tell the stories of AI beyond the computational gobbledygook that it presents itself us with. Right? The, per the, the problem with current day complex computation is that we spend all of our efforts at visualizing it rather than understanding and engaging with it. And visualization is considered as the end point of our engagement with it. So I'm taking my cue from Maya Indira Ganesh, who is a fantastic AI and humanities scholar, who has a wonderful project called Metaphors of AI. And my third prompt very quickly, to go back to why we need poetry, is because we need narratives. Uh, and narratives are not just about telling the story, but about reframing the very conditions through which we tell the stories of AI. And Renata is back just in time because I was going to refer to her work, which has been so significant in creating these narratives, for example, of gender inclusive AI, which is not about thinking of what can we do to use AI for furthering gender, but in fact, telling the story of gender AI in a very different way. And what, how do we kind of take control of these kinds of narratives? And my suggestion then is that we go back to writing poetry and that that's going to be our savior. Okay, I'm going to stop here and hand over to Renata, who's back. Yes, I'm back. I'm sorry. I, I do not understand what's going on with the systems today, but I do understand what is wrong with the systems of today. Uh, and the systems of today, one of the reflections of, of today is be, from dream. We move to playing, you know, we go back to the playground and to prototyping and to playing with ideas and creating and start moving from, you know, resisting these systems of oppression to create it, creating our own systems and uh, prototyping and playing and embedding our values and our community values in, in the possibilities that, that these technologies have. But um, uh, because we have the, these beautiful three minds with us today, uh, better than any AI ever coded, um, I want to ask uh, the participants if they have questions. And if, if you have questions, please feel free to write them in the chat. And uh, we will, uh, we will uh, uh, pass, it to, pass the questions and try to answer. And if... If there are no questions, uh, I think that uh, uh, we can um, have a last round of comments and, and then we wrap up and we move to the next uh, conference. So the, uh, what, what would be like the final message and the final action point uh, starting now in reverse order with Nishan first, then uh, Tiara and then uh, closing with Cynthia, just a final reflection on uh, when we ask the question, AI, uh, uh, for whom, by whom, what would be like the action point that the audience should take from this panel? Um, thanks, Renata. I think for me, it's really very clear and it connects all the different hats that I wear as a researcher, as an activist, and as somebody who works with arts and cultures. Um, I think we need to understand that the AI is just another measure of being human but it is not a scale that we have to measure up to. We cannot put the responsibility of how we define human interaction, communities and, inter and engagements uh, through automation and through AI. And we need to figure out a way by which the measure of the human 
is being human and not being augmented through AI. Like that's how I would want to frame it. Uh, Tiara, please. Um, yeah, um, first of all, thanks uh, Nishant um, for your comment about poetry. I think that's really um, interesting and a nice, something nice for me to think about when, I, when I'm thinking about data colonialism and misrepresentation of indigenous peoples and, and trying to discover ways of accessibility and um, indigenous assertion. Um, I really like, I really like poetry. Um, so cool, thanks for sharing that. I think in terms of last thoughts, I, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm just stuck on acknowledgement. And, and what I mean by that is acknowledging the presence of indigenous peoples and the harm of art, artificial intelligence on indigenous peoples and a, a way to acknowledge that is to stop saying that decolonization is possible um, and to in, inquire modes or gestures of decolonization by actively engaging in research through one owns perspective and helping oneself. Um, taking your own position to hold space for um, individuals um, such as indigenous peoples and other marginalized individuals to receive those resources, to have a dialogue with you, to talk about um, AI or anything otherwise, um, anything techno involving techno culture, for example. So I think my final note is just about encouraging individuals to do their own research um, as, as an active decolonial gesture, as an active acknowledgement. Um, that's, that's, all, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Viera. And even funding the, funding the research, because as we know, you know, like uh, there's a very, very, very limited opportunities uh, uh, for most of the uh, you know, developing nations in the world and indigenous nations in the world to even access, even access research funds and then translations very, very, very few uh, to return to the communities. Uh, Cynthia, which are your like, final reflections on, uh, on, on this conversation today to share with us? Yeah, this is Cynthia, thank you. Um, just kind of building on what um, Nishan and Tiara were saying. So kind of, again, recognizing AI as a, a human pursuit um, and also um, doing the, the research and rooting, um, rooting our knowledge building in actual communities and actual people who are impacted. Um, but as someone who works in tech research um, and the tech industry, I also, uh, I, I think a lot of us who work in this industry, we often feel disempowered that we can't do anything. And I would really like to challenge that um, we have to be pushing harder. We have to organize and uh, uh, collectively ask for more accountability because right now the disproportionate amount of people who care about this work are those who are most impacted and we have limited energy and limited power um, uh, on our own. So I would ask, you know, be um, careful and thoughtful about what, where your learning is coming from and, and basing that in communities um, of people who have that expert knowledge, um, but then joining in and, and recognizing, you know, even if you don't know how you have power, but insisting that you can push um, back on these systems with us, so thanks. Well, thank you, Nishan, Tiara, Cynthia. It has been a wonderful panel uh, from nightmares to action, basically. But we had also the chance to dream and even discuss poetry. Uh, it was a beautiful panel. I thank the organizers as well, uh, uh, the, the Goethe Institute and all the people involved in this. And I pass it to Rodrigo, uh, who has some remark final remarks. Thank you very much for the participation. And I hope to, see, to meet with you in real life at some point. Thank you for holding uh, us all together, Renata, and for planning so that even when you were not present, the show just continued. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everyone.